Okay. Well, uh, I didn't put any due dates on them because of, of not everybody having books. But let's have everything in by Wednesday, unless y'all want to come on Monday. I'm here in town. Yeah, I'm not going to be here. Um, I would love to. <laughs> I'm here. We're in Dallas. Oh, I, oh, I, I got to see a man about a dollar. Well, wait a minute. They, they, they don't pay me to come extra, so I don't think I'll be here. Yeah, that, Fair I, enough. I, I All right, cool. I pay too much not to. I'll be at home. <laughs> I pay too much not to come extra, so yeah. I'll be here. All right. Um, I'm going to pick up a little bit where we left off on Herod, but we're going to wrap that up. I know we did a lot on that, but I wanted you to have an immersive experience in, in how the, uh, the setting, the culture, relates to the Bible passage. And you can see there's so much more to study on that. We won't go that deep into every side uh, issue uh, from here forward. But let's do a bit of review. Here you have the different uh, ones that made up the, uh, the Hasmonean kingdom. Remember they had been uh, taken over by uh, Alexander the Great. Then when Alexander didn't live very long, the Seleucids and the Ptolemies divided up his empire. Uh, by the time the Seleucids from Syria were ruling, uh, there was a great revolt. And that's when there was an independent kingdom. Now, if you take the timeline from the beginning of the Maccabees and the Hasmoneans up through the end of, uh, say, the Book of Acts, you've roughly got the same period of history as the United States. So we have our sense of being Americans from a 200-year history. Now, there's more history than that, but 200 years of being a nation. And, of course, they had more history than that. But 200 years ago, they became a kingdom again, a nation again, independent of the empire. So that's in the thinking of the people in the time of Jesus, except like most human societies, it goes downhill. So you have this uh, Judas Maccabeus. By the way, um, Maccabeus means hammer. It was a nickname. He was the hammer. I think he could put a lawyer commercial on in Montgomery. <laughs> <laughs> and then his brother. Uh, is with him, but then you come down to Aristobulus, who becomes both uses the name king and gets appointed priest. That mixture king that priest. we don't like in America. And then we're going to skip over the various ones, except to notice that Herod has been rewarded for his positions by the Romans, who have who have since taken over. Uh, this goes back to what did we say, 167, about 100 years into the Maccabean Hasmonean uh, rule. The Romans moved in. They said they weren't taking over, but you know how that goes. So by that time, they were appointing kings, and the um, royal family was kind of dying out. If you wanted to go direct descendants, and they only had this teenager, you know, that could inherit. Now, there was a female Alexandra who took the throne briefly, but you know, when her son started getting big enough, they would want a man on the throne. At right, sixteen or seventeen. But Herod had since ingratiated himself to the Romans so that he was named the king of the Jews. And married that Mariamne. And then you remember about his brother-in-law, the teenager who became high priest. And then, died. And then yeah. got drowned. Right. So this is the picture of kingship that people have when Jesus comes into the world and says he's here to preach the kingdom of God. Uh, you memorize that chart now? Yep. I, I think I got it. What is the point of this without going into the details of this section on the right? Um, that it's shady. The corruption of Herod. Mm -hmm. If you were a person on that list, what would that mean to you? You're corrupted. Or you better watch out. Or you're dead. You're right. dead. You're dead. <laughs> what would your relationship be to, to the king? Uh, you would mostly, mostly say, yes, dead. sir. <laughs> and try to find out what he wants. So... Towards the end of his life, he's killing his family right and left because he's suspicious that they want his throne. Even though he's about to die. He wasn't that old, but he, but he wasn't a young man. So he marries for political purposes. He has children for political purposes. He puts them in favor and out of favor, then starts killing them. Now, I told you about the huios and the hos, didn't I? No. In Greek, the word for son is huios. 
a rough breathing and U-I-O-S. The word for pig is hoss, rough breathing and O-S. And apparently there was a saying among the Roman officials that said they would rather be Herod's hoss, pig, than his hoios, his son. Because you have a better chance of what? <laughs> because out of, his, out of his sensitivity to Jewish beliefs, he wouldn't slaughter pigs. Because, you know, Jews don't eat pork. But if you're a son, you're, you're fair game for being killed. <laughs> fair enough. That's the kind of reputation I want in international affairs. I don't think I don't think that kings have to have licenses for anything. No. This is the simpler uh, graph, and it's really for the whole New Testament. Only the top part applies to the life of Christ. And as you'll remember, Herod the Great, he has cast a heavy shadow, but he's not there very long in the life of Christ. Uh, somewhere in the first two years. We take that from the fact that he was killing the babies in Bethlehem up to two years old. And so somewhere around that age. That was also when he was killing some sons. And, uh, and so historians say, no, I imagine he did that too. Because how many babies could there have been in Bethlehem, a small town? A few. A few. Right. So then these people uh, inherit, these three, inherit his kingdom when he dies. Why doesn't Aristobulus inherit? He did. What happened to him? He died. Killed him. His daddy had him strangled to death. So, but he did have a grandson. I mean, Herod had a grandson who became king kind of in the time of Acts. And in fact, uh, his son pretty much picked up all the territory that Herod the Great had. So you have these people in the life of Jesus. And you don't really pick up these people until later. Now, you know the story about Herodias? We'll talk about it when we get to John the Baptist. Her. Oh, is he the one who... Um... Married a couple of these, but probably not this Philip, but married brothers back and forth. And that's what John the Baptist condemned. For. Is he the one who had him beheaded? Yes. Okay. Uh, Herod Agrippa. Oh, okay. Because I know Herod, like, wasn't it his wife who hated John the Baptist? Yeah. Uh, this one, yes. Yeah. But Herod Agrippa II lived with his sister Bernice as his wife. Okay. <laughs> okay. So when you read in Acts that Agrippa and Bernice came in with great pomp, it's just dripping with sarcasm. Hmm. This is the king of the Jews. They're supposed to be a religious nation. They're supposed to be a theocracy. And that's what they have. And Drusilla? Is Drusilla, Drusilla married the Roman governor Felix. So when Paul appears before Felix, you know, first it's Festus and then it's Felix, Drusilla is there. Okay. Thank you very much. They're very cozy, aren't they? It's a good thing that politics doesn't run that way today. Backroom deals and cozy relationships. Really? No, it's just not that way at all. Oh, by the way, Bernice is really Ber Bernanke. I brought some pictures just to give you some, some orientation. Herod had several palaces. Of course, the main one would have been in Jerusalem, almost adjacent to the temple. But he had several spread out. Uh, a couple of them over on in the desert area beyond the Jordan, meaning on the east side of the Jordan River. One of the most famous is Macarius, and it's still there in ruins. And that is, according to Josephus, where John the Baptist was imprisoned and killed. Interesting, can you see it's a man-made hill? They're just not conical hills like that in a desert area. And you can see that there was a road going up to it. Now, one that's been uh, studied more recently is called the Herodium, which was not too far away. And um, you see how they've made roads so you can get up to it now. But I have a few pictures for you to get a sense of, of the wealth and, and, and position of this man. There's an overview looking down on the top of that cone. And if you can see, uh, if he wanted to get where there was a breeze, because, you know, way up high, uh, this had to be a courtyard. These are buildings. I believe this was a little synagogue or something like that. 
It, uh, according to Josephus, the historian it had four towers like that on, on four sides. And these are the remnants of it. This is the close-up of, of the recess area. Perhaps there was a Torah scroll in there or something like that. And uh, these are Her Herodian Herod's walls that are still there. Now, we talked about the palace in Jericho. Uh, that had been built by his wife's ancestors. You know about the Dead, uh, the, uh, the dead Sea, how low it is? Mm -hmm. It's 1,000 feet below the level of, of Jerusalem and everything, maybe 2,000 below Jerusalem, the lowest place on earth. So you go down some pretty significant hills to get down there. And so it's protected from the weather, and, um, and in the winter, it'll be warmer down there. So they had a winter palace they went to down there. And there is an aerial shot of it. If you've noticed, um, this is a lot of buildings and, and columns and stuff. There's also, this is uh, the Wadi Kelp. Wadi is kind of a, it means creek or river. But you know, in that part of the world, they dry up seasonally. Mm -hmm. This one though, seems to have a lot. But you see the terrain. Uh, Jerusalem and Judea is mostly up here. If you come way down all of this, uh, and you end up in Jericho. Well, he actually had part of his palace on one side of the Greek and part on the other. And I'm going to show you how elaborate it was. This is a closer up picture, and I'm sorry about the quality of the picture. But you can see buildings over here. Uh, you can see that there was a courtyard here that was common architecture, and you would have had hallways around here with rooms and a covered porch. You know what that is? That's the swimming pool. This is a closer up of, um, of these columns. Is that where Eric Bagger was standing? Mm -hmm. So, you look down here, see I put the water in them? Two swimming pools, 10 feet deep at the deep end, steps going down into it. They were built in two stages. Um, some have guessed maybe there was a men's pool and a women's pool, but that may not be. But they're pretty big. Um, at the Y, where I try to swim laps, although I haven't had time since school started, uh, it's about the same size as it, which is 65 feet length and like 40 feet wide. So just about big enough for one person. Yeah. Probably, you probably have two of those in your backyard. So there's a close up of the swimming pools. And I've seen some pictures with people standing in them that, uh, where you can see that it's at the deepest. That's nine or 10 feet deep. So it was a decent swimming pool. Josephus says that Herod encouraged his brother-in-law to go swimming, and he instructed his servants to go swimming with him and act like they were playing with him and hold him underwater, which they did until he drowned. And then the word got all the way back to Caesar, and he got caught on the carpet for it, but he's still king. This is a picture of how someone thinks the actual palace would have looked in the time of Herod. You see the courtyard I was talking about? They were usually uh, painted in pretty vivid colors, lots of, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, frescoes on the walls, lots of mosaic tile. This is another courtyard with various buildings here. This is a common feature of uh, mansions of that period. Uh, it was uh, kind of like your spa. Let me see if I can do it. Uh, can anybody read this up here? Let's see. Yes. One. What does seven say? Cold, Cold bathroom. bathroom. Okay, so you start on this end. You get dressed for going in the sauna kind of thing. And then I think you go into the hot room. Uh, there was a word for it, something darium. And then after you sweat it off, you go into the uh, tepidarium, which is just a warm room. And then you go into the frigidarium, where you get cool. And then you go jump into this little uh, fountain and, and get clean. That's, uh, this little structure is still there. Uh, you see it right here? Uh, and that, that's the kind of mansion he would have lived in. Uh, you notice this over here? It went up to another uh, wing of the palace that they added on the other side of the creek. Sure, you can get bored trying to go see. 
these are just individual pictures I gathered uh, to give you an idea of how wealthy uh, the man was. We'll start down here. This uh, sarcophagus was found only a, a few years ago at the Herodium, which is you know one of the palaces. And somebody had spent his life, his professional life, trying to study the Herodium, had concluded that this was Herod's actual tomb. And for a while, uh, we all thought, wow, they found Herod's tomb. You'll notice this has been broken up. The theory was that when people um, were free of the Herod family, that they desecrated his tomb. There was no body there. However, as I was reading on it uh, in the last couple of days, the new thinking is a man who had all those palaces, built the Jerusalem temple, uh, it was a, the, the tomb was like the size of this room, only taller. And they're saying, no, he would not have had that small uh, a, a uh, monument to himself. So they think they still haven't found it. Dr. Parker was telling me this morning, he thinks it's deeper down in the Herodium somewhere. Because Josephus does say that's where, that's where he was buried. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Why would he be buried in the Herodium and not in like, the big palace in Jerusalem or one of the nicer areas? Well, probably because it was more um, exclusive and restricted. The current royal family, some of them are born buried in Westminster Abbey, but others are at, um, somewhere at Windsor, you know, around an old thing, place that they've owned. Or you remember the Princess of Wales, um, Diana, Princess of Wales. Uh, she's buried on a small island on her family's property so that the hordes of people won't come there. It may have been that he was so elevated they didn't want it to, where didn't just anybody could come. Okay. Plus, it's hard to find a place in Jerusalem. Everything's built up, even back then. But yeah, it is a good question, but the historian says he was there. That's just what I was just like wondering, because Herodian wasn't, it was like an integrity. Yeah. This is actually one of the four tiles uh, from one of his palaces. This is I think this is from the Herodium. Notice how the walls were made of special shaped stones and uh, a special architecture. Uh, I think this was the Herodium. This uh, has only recently been found and it was his theater, his personal theater. And uh, you can see probably this was a raised platform where he could watch or maybe it was the stage. And there's parts of the paint still on the walls. I'd love to see all of that. This one, I, do, uh, I think I have a little video to look at. This one is uh, on the coast, obviously, at Caesarea Maritima. There are lots of ancient towns called Caesarea. Who do you think they're named after? Caesarea. C-A-E-S-A-R-E-A. Caesar. Caesar. So this one's Maritima on the sea. And Herod built an artificial harbor there. He had them sink huge stones deep under the the soft seabed and build walls up on it so that he could have this um, private, uh, I mean this man-made um, harbor, you see where you can pull ships up there. And I have seen on the internet that there is a national park now where you can scuba dive and see some of the ruins down there. If you'll notice, we're going to see a lot more. There is a, a, a theater there. I think it's over here. There's a hippodrome, a horse race track. They were all Herod's uh, creations. Now, I'm going to try to see if I can make a video come up. Uh, I'm going to have more links on here than we can use today, but they'll be on the web for you to, to look at some more. <laughs> so, to wrap up, really wrap up, you need to remember that Rome encases the whole history of the New Testament period as far as who's controlling things. But they allow levels of local uh, administration. And it starts with the Maccabees who had revolted against the previous empire, the remnants of Alexander's empire under the Seleucids. 
And then they gradually took on the name maybe of their hometown or something and became known as the Hasmonean family. Herod married into that family and then for two more generations after his, his family ruled. But it pretty much was over uh, not long after the period of the New Testament. As you know, Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans. Now we're going to look at religion. We'll come back to it later. This is one of my, to me, one of the most interesting sites I want to see when y'all pick up a collection so I can go over there. Uh, 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 this is the Nazareth synagogue. No, the Capernaum synagogue. You know, when Jesus uh, leaves home, he moves to Capernaum on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. This particular one was made like the 300s AD, but I've got pictures we'll look at when we get there. You can see that they built on top of this foundation, on top of this foundation, on top of this foundation, and you can trace it right back to the time of Jesus. So you can go and stand in a synagogue we know that Jesus preached in. Now, we're going to look at Jewish religion in Jesus' day. I'm sure there were many uh, people who had moved into the area that were not Jewish, that had other religions, but the only religion that mattered in Judea and Galilee and Samaria was Judaism. So what was it like? Of course, the main characteristic of Judaism is its monotheism. Uh, a, an observant Jew, ever since the time of Moses, every day gets up and says, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. But it says it in Hebrew. And they're supposed to say when they rise up and when they lie down, and when they walk by the side of the way. There is nothing more central to Judaism than one God. Now, they had a national identity. You'll notice some of this comes out of the textbook that I ask you to look at. But their sense was that they were God's chosen people in God's chosen place, that God has a special destiny for Israel, and the great deliverer is coming, the Messiah. Now, you know, I can't remember my American history, but wasn't there a period where they talked about the manifest destiny, that America was destined to make yeah. the whole world free? Well, uh, people who thought they were free don't much appreciate our attitude about that. Uh, yeah. They think we might be colonial, sort of like Europe was. And, but we're not. We didn't take over Hawaii, or we didn't leave Puerto Rico at a, a sub-state standard or anything like that. You only took Petersburg. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, a people have a sense of identity. We do think of ourselves as uh, home of the free and the land of the brave. And there is truth to that. Everybody that's needs a sense think, of identity. That's not all we think of, too, as a nation. Oh, but, but we're better than everybody else. We don't even have any problems. Particularly in the 1950s, there was nothing wrong in America. Oh, we're not in the 1950s. Oh, we're not. And, and, and uh, do you think that uh, everybody was doing well in the 1950s? Yeah. In America? Absolutely. Well. Absolutely. Very well. No. And where did you live? Excuse me? And where were you living? In New York. Mm -hmm. And if you'd lived in Montgomery, it might have been different. Mm -hmm. Not by choice. Not by your choice, no. That's right, no. It's by the choice, choice of people who held there. rights down and opportunity down. That's I, true. I will tell you that, uh, and I'm, I'm sorry to get off track again, but a man that I worked with here for a while, he was the registrar, but he was a retired administrator from the Montgomery Public Schools. In fact, he had been my junior high school assistant principal. But he was the principal at Lanier High School, the oldest, nicest at the time, high school, for 31 years. He was there when schools were racially integrated, and he escorted the first black student into the, into the school. At that time, Lanier was in the rich part of town. And the new uh, other white school was Lee High School, which is the one I went to. But it was more blue-collar people. 
Back then, there were just the two white schools. There were black schools, but we didn't know much about that. We white people didn't. And he said, we had more trouble at Lee. It's actually a half generation before me when this happened. We had more trouble at Lee with racial integration than they did at Lanier, which may seem counterintuitive because we were the working class people and they were the rich people. Mr. Cutt says it's because the working class people felt threatened. If black people have opportunities to take the job, they're going to lose their job. Rich people weren't so threatened. It's that dynamic that I'm talking about when I make fun of Wharton in the 1950s great. And uh, no, they weren't all great. And, and but what I was saying that, that depending on where you were, yes. New York didn't have that problem. Right. Right. Oh, my wife grew up outside of Boston. In the next town over, there was one black person, you know. It was different. It was different. Well, you have that here in Clanton. Yes. I segregated, integrated, I should say. Right. Um, United Methodist Church in Clanton, the first black person to be a member. But, and moved into a... But they have welcomed you with open arms, right? Some of them have welcomed you with open arms. Yes. <laughs> the leadership, yes. maybe. <laughs> but just, yes, because that's what I am now, I'm mm -hmm. one of the lay leaders. Right. Also, where I moved, I was the first black person there. Yeah. Let so, me... Let me throw in another perspective, and you may find me, because this is my, I grew up in civil rights in Montgomery, so it's my frame of reference. Do any of you know who Fred Gray is from the civil rights movement? He was the first lawyer for Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King in Montgomery. He was also the preacher of what is now the Southside Church of Christ. I grew up in the Church of Christ in Montgomery. I didn't hear of him until I was in my 40s and moved away. I mean, it was the, I mean, it was the same religious group, you know. And I knew nothing about this until somebody told me when I was in my 40s. He is a board member emeritus of this university and has been a board member for many years. But we were so segregated that even within my religious tradition, we didn't have anything to do black and white with each other. And what I'm talking about is culture and tradition are so awfully powerful mm -hmm. that we don't need to let the world move in and define our values. And that's where Jesus is going to come in as a counter culture, but a very quiet one. So anyway, you and I, we're going to go down memory lane and these, and these young people are going to get tired of us. The Jews also had a That's central identity. Yeah. <laughs> we wandered. They had shared religious practices. All Jews attended synagogue, even in Jerusalem. Now, as an educated person, you of course know the difference in a synagogue and a temple in the first century. Definitely. How many temples did the Jews have? One. One. How many synagogues did they have? Nobody can count. How many synagogues did they have before the Babylonian captivity? None. No. There are no synagogues until the Jews no longer have a temple and have been displaced. So the synagogue developed in the 70 years that the Jewish population has been taken over to uh, Babylon, Persia, as it, as it changes over. And there were traditions that grew up, but it was, they no longer had the temple to unite them. And so they developed the reading of the Torah, the, the scriptures. That was the central focus of their gathering. Uh, Sunagoge is the Greek word for come together, a gathering. And so on Sabbath, they would come together in synagogues. Everyone went to synagogue. They observed every Sabbath. You did not work on the Sabbath. Uh, one day we'll go into how very Orthodox Jews uh, enforce that today. I'll give you two examples. You do not use an elevator because the tradition was you could not kindle a fire and to run an elevator the electricity has to have a spark and therefore you cannot use an elevator. That's not the only thing. You cannot take anything apart or put anything together. Therefore, 
before sundown on Friday, you will tear apart your paper towels and your toilet paper so you will not be tearing them on Sabbath. That's going to be real rough to get the toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> if you think uh, you may need... I was waiting for you to say something. If you think you may need the light on in the middle of the night, because the day starts at sundown, mm -hmm. you better leave it on. So, Electricity bill. No, that's not, no. that's not what it's about. But they also, and, and they did have the temple. And uh, I think I've told you, there's this temple mount society that's already built a new menorah of solid gold taller than a person. They built a crown for the high priest when he returns to the temple. Um, I'll, I'll try to show you that site someday. Um, they've always believed they would go back to the temple. As a matter of fact, what, do, what did you say after the Passover meal? Next year in Jerusalem. So would modern day Jews still think there's a Messiah to be coming? Maybe. But I think with the two millennia now of uh, being overshadowed by Christianity, they would say, ah, I'm not sure we knew exactly what we we're talking about when we just said Messiah. Okay. By the way, this came up in my other class. Anybody want to guess? Uh, in all of its forms, Christianity is the most uh, popular religion in the world. Uh, 31, 32% of the world claims to be Christians. What percent claims to be Jewish? Only like seven, six, six, I have no clue. Before I checked this time for class, it was 0.2%. Oh. But a new estimate, uh, from that was from 2010. In 2015, a new estimate is 0.1% of the world population. Wow. Islam is 25% and rising. Yes. We know that. That's not an actual model. That's more fearful. Never mind. It's, it's the advanced. We're just counting religion. Right. And, and, and part of it is because uh, more advanced societies don't have as many children. Many uh, Islamic countries are, are still having lots of children. Mm -hmm. So anyway, and then they had both scripture and tradition. The Torah, what we call the Pentateuch, the Law of Moses. Uh, inviolable. Everybody agreed you had to do that. They always agree on what it meant, but then you, you had to do what it said. But then equally, by the time of Jesus, they had developed the traditions of the elders. Sort of like if you go online and you find the, the um, out of copyright commentaries, and you know how many papers we get from Matthew Henry's commentaries and stuff that, you know, from long ago, you just assume that what they wrote was right. Well, the traditions of the elders were as binding as scripture to most Jews. Why don't you wash your hands the way the elders teach us to? Remember how Jesus ran into that? Of course, when you read the recorded discussions of the rabbis on these things, ah, oh, but Rabbi Akiva said this, but Rabbi Hillel said this, and so what is our tradition was very important to I'm going to go over this quickly. You can study it on your own, these 50-minute classes. Of course, there are the Hebrew scriptures, and I want you to know the Jewish arrangement of what we have in our Old Testament. You see in the middle, under the word Hebrew scriptures, the word Tanakh. It's not spelled with capitals in the middle. I did that for a reason. It's an acronym for the Torah, you see on the left, the Nevaim, you see in the green, and the Ketuvim, which you see in the white. Those are the three parts of the full Hebrew Bible. And they're not in the same order that we use them, except for the Torah. That's less the same. But there's a chronological order. It makes sense the way it goes. Now, the Nevi'im means the prophets, but they don't use the word the same way we do. There are the former prophets and the latter prophets. The former prophets being Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings. Of course, we say first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, they do too, but um, you think, those people weren't prophets. Well, Samuel was. But prophets spoke for God in that period. So to them, it's more significant that the prophets were active in that period than the various kings or judges. And they don't use the same names we do. 
whatever the first few words of the book are, are is or are. That's the name of that book. Then there are the latter prophets that are like we like we do them. Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. And then what we sometimes call the minor prophets, they call the book of the twelve. A collection of twelve other prophets. Why do we group them up in the um, order we do? It comes from the Septuagint, the Greek translation from 300 years before Christ. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a more linear uh, Western Greek Roman way of thinking in time. And so we tried to put them in a, in a certain order. I just know that like some of the books aren't, they're not necessarily in chronological order. Right. In the sense of like but when there, they There's go. a sense of order. We think this kind of goes good. However, on this one, we're not the same, but they're similar. It, why did they divide it that way? These, uh, yeah, I would right best here. say uh, that means the writings. It would be a stretch to call it fiction by a long shot. But they are more literary than historical. And so you can see Psalms, Proverbs, Job. You can see how those are more like stories or poetry. Psalms. Then they have. How would Job be considered like? Job well, actually, um, the term Job that we usually. Love poetry. Oh, yeah. The term Job that we use is the wisdom literature, is a better term for it. Okay. But it Job does have more like verse than we can recognize in, in English. Yeah. Then the five Megillo or scrolls, Song of Songs, Ruth, Lamentations, separate from Jeremiah, Ecclesiastes, and Esther. Now that's an odd assortment, yeah. isn't it? Uh, why Esther? How many times is God mentioned in the book of Esther? Not very many. Zero. Oh, I thought That may be a reason. Also, it comes from a time when they were not in Israel. There's nothing uh, about the homeland in it. Ecclesiastes is just how horrible life is. Lamentations, <laughs> except for the end. Yeah, I love Ecclesiastes. Lamentations is poetry about the fall of Jerusalem. Ruth is a beautiful story. It does have historical implications, but only the very end when you find out that David's a descendant. And then Song of Songs. It is the I'm going to assign each of you a chapter of Song of Songs to do a sermon on in chapel. Uh, I would love it. Would you? You're going to do Climb in the Coconut Tree? Mm -hmm. Okay, you explain that one. She's like, uh, I'm going to drop the class. That was last week. Uh, you won't see me. Oh, wait a minute. This is a New Testament class. We can't do that. Sure, we can. Song of Songs and like. Hey, I'll do a sermon on Ecclesiastes. Any thoughts? Oh, Ecclesiastes is great. Yeah. Great stuff. All right. We have one minute left. <laughs> you notice that these are the post-exilic period. Chronicles seems to be, and Chronicles, you know, is a different presentation, the same information that's in Kings and Samuel. And many people believe that Ezra compiled Chronicles. So maybe that's why they're kept. Uh, we will have to pick up on this. I was hoping we'll go faster. We're going to talk about the different groups, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, and the Zealots, plus the Apocalyptics. I do want you to go ahead and start reading the texts that are listed in, uh, on Blackboard. If you have any trouble finding it because I'm still tweaking this class, email me and I'll tell you which passages to read. So just read them, take the quiz. Assuming I get the quiz up. Got it. What quiz do you do? Oh, Wednesday. Everything's due by Wednesday when you get to class.